Uh, hello everyone and welcome to the online roundtable discussion entitled Reporting Ukraine, Fake News and Disinformation as Indispensable Part of Russia's War Against Ukraine. The roundtable is organized by the Contemporary Ukraine Studies Program at the Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies, University of Alberta. Uh, my name is Alexander Pankeyev. I'm the editor-in-chief of the Forum for Ukrainian Studies, an online analytical publication project of the already mentioned Contemporary Ukraine Studies program, and I will be the moderator of the roundtable today. Dr. Vida Yakovleva, the research associate at the Contemporary Ukraine Studies program, will be moderating the Q&A session. The topic of today's discussion is, discussion is really timely and important. A lot has been written about Russia's disinformation campaign and its efforts to spread, fake, to spread fake news, which flooded Western countries in the past decade and had different effects around the globe. Today our focus will be mostly on the role of Russia's disinformation in the escalation of its war against Ukraine since February 25th of this year. And we have four, uh, sorry, five uh, distinguished experts today with us who will help us to navigate this very complex topic. We have Maria Avdieva, Research Director at the European Expert Association, Natalia Steblina, a professor and in, in journalism and social communications department, Vasily Stus, the next national university in Ukraine, uh, Catherine Vasilovsky, a uh, freelance journalist and fact checker mainly for the in, for the uh, international broadcaster Deutsche Welle, Ingrid Dickinson, a young global professional at the Digital Forensic Research Lab of the Atlantic Council, and Emerson uh, Brookin, a senior uh, resident fellow at the Digital Forensic Research Lab uh, of the Atlantic Council. More extended biographies of our guests are available on our website. Uh, the first question will be to Maria Vdieva. Uh, Maria, production and, dissemin and dissemination of disinformation are essential components of Russia's warfare strategies. Uh, could you please tell us what Russia has been doing to destabilize the situation inside of Ukraine since the escalation of Ukraine in terms of its uh, communication strategies? Yes, hello. Uh, thank you for having me. I'm sorry for this. Uh, uh, if the connection will fail, I actually am right now in the city of Sumy, uh, which was uh, recently liberated. I mean, Sumy mm -hmm. region was recently liberated from the Russian troops. We have been uh, to Trostanets today documenting Russian war crimes there, and there are many, and the, the uh, picture of what is happening in, in Trostanets is awful and uh, we have uh, many more uh, awful things to come. So speaking about uh, Russian disinformation, I would, uh, uh, I think this is necessary to point out that uh, Russia was uh, preparing ground and preparing uh, this uh, new invasion uh, together with preparing military operation because since uh, Russian troops started to mass on Ukrainian borders, uh, in uh, late October, we noticed that uh, at the same time, Russian uh, state media launched the disinformation campaign, and the aim of that campaign was uh, to create grounds. I'm sorry. I'm the aim of the information campaign was to go Ukraine and uh, who is preparing an offensive operation on Donbass. And Russia uh, was uh, deliberately spreading different narratives. I will speak about them a little later. And all of that uh, enabled Putin later to claim that there is a need uh, to for Ukraine to be liberated. and. Uh, We have some technical difficulties and we cannot hear Maria 
at this moment. Okay, uh, uh, maybe uh, until we're waiting uh, for Maria to reconnect, I have almost the same question uh, to uh, Dr. Uh, Natalia Stablina. So, uh, Dr. Natalia Stablina, can you comment on this? Uh, yes, uh, thank you for uh, having me. Of course, uh, Russian uh, disinformation and uh, Russian uh, pro propaganda, we were experiencing it uh, uh, not only uh, on the 24th of February, but uh, long, long ago. So uh, maybe, uh, uh, and uh, uh, of course we have uh, several examples of it on social media, on the TV channels, uh, and uh, so on and so forth. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, nowadays in uh, Ukraine, uh, especially uh, in the southern uh, and eastern uh, regions, uh, uh, telegram channels, re regional telegram channels, uh, news channels are extremely uh, popular. And uh, these channels also used uh, by uh, Russian propaganda just to spread uh, disinformation and uh, fal falsehood. For instance, uh, before, um, before the 24th of uh, February, uh, there were some speculations about uh, Russian speakers uh, in Odessa uh, feeling uncom uncomfortable uh, because of uh, some uh, activists, uh, pro-Ukrainian activists, or even uh, some imagined uh, Nazis and so on and so forth. So, uh, there were some speculations uh, about this and uh, about uh, uh, Odessa local inhabitants feeling uncomfortable uh, because of Ukrainian language or Ukrainian uh, culture. And uh, <clears throat> uh, there were also, uh, they were spreading some examples about uh, um, Russian speaker, uh, Russian speaker, Rus Ru Russian speakers, professors from uh, Odessa universities who uh, were uh, who should quit because of uh, their uh, pro-Russian position, or because, uh, for instance, one professor he shared with his uh, students uh, um, uh, a textbook which was written in Russian language, and there was some speculation that he was uh, uh, just forced to quit. But of course. Uh, uh, there were just rumors and unchecked information. Uh, so um, I, to, to sum up, uh, I uh, may say that, uh, of course, uh, social networks and uh, mass media in Ukraine uh, on all levels, national level or regional level, uh, they uh, used uh, very effectively uh, to just spread all this uh, disinformation and uh, propaganda. Thank you. Thank you, Natalia. We have uh, Maria back. Uh, Maria, you can continue. Yeah, I'm sorry. I don't know when the, the connection was interrupted. So uh, uh, I will start a little bit. Uh, so again, uh, so I was telling that Russia was preparing a ground for, for this offensive that it started on the 24th of February since uh, October. And uh, what was happening is that Russian state media were creating grounds, uh, sh trying to show that Ukraine is preparing some kind of offensive operation. And that is what, what they continue to do now. So how it usually works. Russia has uh, a vast number of controlled uh, telegram channels. These telegram channels are usually controlled by Russian special services such as GRU and uh, FSB and others. So uh, what they will do is they will put uh, a fake narrative or a misinformation or a fake video on one of these Telegram channels, for example, stating uh, that Ukraine is preparing uh, an attack on some, uh, some object uh, in the occupied territory on Donbass. And from that, this narrative will be picked up by uh, Russian mainstream media, such as Ria Nova, Stetas, and others. And then uh, this will migrate to the uh, to, to Russian state officials, which will later that day uh, speak about such kind of uh, fake information or disinformation as something they, they are 
well aware of. Like it's all over on the ma- on the media, and now we are voicing this officially, and that uh, that happens every day. So every day, uh, Russian uh, state media will come with new sorts of disinformation and fake information. And why this is very dangerous? It's because for this time Russia has uh, created a, a completely different uh, information poll uh, uh, in in Russia itself. So they have managed to block uh, any almost any kind of uh, in, in, in independent information. There is nothing that is coming inside of Russia. And uh, by spreading 24 seven, this Russian propaganda and uh, on, on state channels and everywhere, uh, they uh, they create the situation when the uh, uh, people of Russia are so brainwashed that they now do not even attempt to find any kind of reliable information that's that's easier for them to believe what they are being fed up on the on the russian state channels that's one direction so russian disinformation is targeting the russian population itself and it is very successful in that because as we see in the num and the last numbers of the recent polls uh, the uh, support of putin among russian population is growing actually and more people now support the foreign policy of russia than they did before the invasion happened so this propaganda uh, for for the in for the population inside Russia is effective. But what is more dangerous now is that Russia is trying to target and is targeting also the population in, uh, in Europe, in, uh, Western, uh, other, in other Western countries. How they do that is that they uh, will try to say that that is only Putin himself who is in charge of all the uh, aggression and all the... Uh, horrible things committed by Russian troops in Ukraine, whereas Russian citizens are not responsible for that. So they will go for this narrative of so-called good Russians who, who shouldn't be responsible for what Putin is doing. And that is very dangerous because they try to put it all over the, uh, so on all the platform available and uh, many, uh, well, not many, but some uh, Western uh, media and platforms will give them this right to speak because we here think that we are in democratic society and everyone has a fr- has a freedom of speech and we need to hear all voices. And so Russians will come here and voice these messages saying that they are not responsible for what Russia is doing because that's only Putin and uh, we do not have to be accountable for that. And we West should not put sanctions on all Russian citizens because they are not responsible for what is happening and that is as i say very dangerous because i see see this now as a new tendency and it is it will be growing uh, and it is already growing and uh, uh, they're trying to find more and more such possibilities to come out and push forward this uh, this uh, message that they are not responsible and uh, uh, for the sake of uh, of truth uh, we need to to state very clearly and strongly that Russia is now uh, doing uh, aggression, uh, the act of aggression uh, against Ukraine. And uh, all citizens of Russia must bear this responsibility. Would it be moral responsibility, economic responsibility, or criminal responsibility if they were uh, if they were participating uh, in this war? Uh, and also media have have special responsibility for making this war happen because they were deliberately creating grounds for this for this war and they now try to deny the acts of genocide and the acts of aggression and the acts of uh, murders uh, committed by russian troops in ukraine they they spread these lies deliberately and that's why they are also accountable for what Russian troops are committing in Ukrainian territory because the media that uh, support this, they also have the same uh, responsibility as those who actually committed these war crimes. And that's why I now concentrate 
uh, my work mostly on uh, documenting Russian war crimes committed in Ukraine and helping those who do uh, who who do this work because uh, I think that this is very important to show the world the truth. The, what is actually happening here in Ukraine and uh, so that Russia will not be able to cover up what they try to do now, to cover up their crimes and to deny them and to put forward the uh, misleading narratives accusing Ukrainians, accusing the Ukraine in uh, Ukrainian uh, far right groups and everything what they have already come up, what we know, uh, what is usually called is what about ism when they will, you know, try to come up with some other things just to change the narrative, change the discussion so that we will not discuss the mass murders and massacre in Bucha, but uh, some other small things uh, which Russia comes up with. Thank you, Maria. Thank you for your answer. And the next question is to Catherine Vasilovsky. Uh, Catherine, has Russia's propaganda uh, strategies in in Germany changed drastically after the escalation of the war? Uh, do you see any signs that some disinformation campaigns have been tailored specifically to influence the German audience? If yes, what are the main messages and tools are being employed? So, um, uh, yeah, I would say that um... Russian propaganda changed worldwide drastically after the 24th of February, also in Germany, of course, but worldwide. And I don't see especially tailored disinformation in Germany. But what we recently see that is that um, the Russian embassies play an important role. So if you just check those, the social media accounts of them, you can see that they um, post and um, post uh, uh, propaganda and disinformation in all countries and then they, that they post the similar things. And what also Maria already said that is that um, Russia is trying to implement telegram channels also in Germany, of course, with their disinformation. But I don't see specially tailored disinformation for Germany. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. And the next question I have uh, for uh, Amerson. Uh, Amerson, can you walk us through the details of how Russia uses social media uh, to spread this information about Ukraine in the West now? It's a great question. And I, I'd start by noting how different the Russian methods and tactics are that we see now uh, versus how we were thinking about Russian influence operations targeting the West before February 24. So I, I think many in this audience know Russian information operations rose to Western prominence because of the, the uh, Internet Research Agency and, and sock puppet operations that were targeting Western discourse uh, through their fabrication of fake uh, media outlets which they planted stories, which they then tried to disseminate into the mainstream using information laundering. I say, and then actually this, this led to then a whole um, a theorizing in the West about a new kind of warfare that Russia fought in the gray zone or utilized uh, hybrid warfare tactics and that we should be prepared to meet them in kind uh, when we entered confrontation. But I, I say all that because that doesn't seem to be the case uh, coming out of February 24. Outside of a bit of suspicious activity on Twitter, uh, ascribed to an Indian influence network, which was likely commercially motivated, there was not significant evidence of social media manipulation that we found so far uh, concurrent with the invasion or in the days before. Uh, it seems really that especially especially those first crucial few days that Russia was not focused on Western opinion. And I think this makes sense when when one uh, considers that the the actual decision to invade was made likely uh, by Putin only a few days prior to the operation beginning, and only a few people were aware of that operation. And especially for the first few days, uh, Russian propaganda, did not acknowledge that Russian soldiers were anywhere but Donetsk and Luhansk. And the, this public messaging 
And the, the lack of coordination in, I think, the Russian military bureaucracy meant that this information component was not, uh, could not be a priority, at least as far as it targeted the West. And now, now we see things starting to change now, but it's not so much social media manipulation. It's Russia using its seat on the UN Security Council to platform and draw attention to the, uh, uh, the biolabs narrative, for instance. Uh, th this idea that, that Ukraine is developing military grade bioweapons and therefore the Russian intervention is, is an act of self-defense. This is not a narrative, as far as we can tell, that, that Russia was prioritizing prior to the invasion, uh, but it seems to have been maybe a, a decision that was made to try to regain some ground in uh, and among uh, Western audiences. And indeed, we've seen some far right commentators in the United States then echo the Biolabs narrative. But this sort of um, uh, using official channels to spread narratives, then hoping that political elites in the West pick up and amplify them, that is a very old Russian disinformation strategy going back to the Cold War, but it's not the same as, as more recent actions. And it's very much not what we anticipated. So that's where we are now when we talk about the Western tar. Thank you, Emerson. Thank you, Emerson. Before we proceed to the next question, reminder to our audience that you can post questions in Q&A window and we will be collecting them in uh, several minutes also. And the next question is also for Ingrid Dickinson. Uh, Ingrid, you just recently released uh, an amazing report about how an alleged fact-checking website is spreading Russian propaganda. You particularly examined a photo of one of the victims of Chernigov airstrike that happened on the first day of Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine. Could you please tell us more about your the investigation and other your findings in this area? Sure. Um, so when I originally found in the Telegram channel you're speaking about is uh, called War on Fakes. It's directed at Russian speakers. Um, it's all in Russian. And I found it um, maybe around February 25th, 26th, um, noticed that it had had gotten a following um, and it, it had only begun on February 23rd, but already, you know, about 50,000 people uh, were following it. So I kind of began tracking this over the next few days um, and within maybe four to five days uh, of the channel beginning, it had about 200,000 followers um, and has only really amplified since then. Right now it's a, over 700,000. Um, so is, is up there as one of the most popular channels uh, in Russia. So this was very interesting to me uh, compared to other channels uh, with a similar number of subscribers. This growth rate, rate was really just unprecedented. Um, so this is what helped me identify it. Um, but what War on Fakes does is really take the authority given to fact-checking organizations, um, probably similar to what Catherine does. Uh, and it takes this and sort of makes these fake fact checks. Uh, so let's say information comes out, such as in, in that example uh, of a bombing in Ukraine, they may take this and then put out a fake fact check and say, oh no, this person is actually a crisis actor. Look at this and this and this. Um, and classically, it may take some truth and then mix that in with falsehoods. Um, and interesting enough, I think that this has become maybe a big problem, especially around information coming out about the war in Ukraine. Uh, I've seen recently that Russian state media has actually released an entire show called Anti-Fake, uh, where they basically use the same kind of tactic. Uh, so we're starting to see, from my understanding, more and more of these kind of fake fact-checking tropes. And they're very problematic because it, it confuses the information ecosystem uh, and makes it really hard for people who are already just trying to, to read one thing and get truthful information out of that. And then you have to go and try to discern which fact-checkers are legitimate, and there are ways to do that. Uh, but especially for the Russian population right now, who has access to much less than they should, um, I think this makes it very, very complicated to get true information about the war. Thank you. Thank you, Ingrid. 
the next question is to Maria Avdeyeva. Uh, Maria, uh, in one of your articles, you say that it is essential to take further steps to reduce Kremlin's available resources in the information field across the uh, particularly Eastern partnership countries. We see that many of Russia's TV channels and websites have been blocked now in that region. Uh, but my question, is it enough to stop the spread of Russia's disinformation? What else should be done or implemented to reduce Russia's influence? Thank you. Yeah, great question. More to be done, so uh, especially now during the war. Uh, we fully, all of us here fully understand and well are well aware of that Russia is using information as another type of warfare uh, during the war. And now uh, we are given uh, platforms, our platforms, democratic platforms for, for Russian uh, officials to voice their misinformation, disinformation, and to go uh, with this with the outrageous fight on the international platforms and have the right to speak up. And uh, that is why here uh, in Ukraine, we think that it should be changed so uh, where, where, where it is possible, uh, Russian state media and propaganda platforms should be banned because they are now not the means of providing information. They are the means of warfare and they use information as a warfare and they use this platform to manipulate uh, the uh, opinions and choices of other people and to uh, create the very uh, dangerous uh, grounds for further aggressive operations. I'm sure that you are well aware of that Russian state media are now, open, are now openly discussing the possibility of invading Poland, of invading Baltic states. That is the question what, which is discussed on Russian mainstream media in prime time. And we all know that nothing is discussed on Russian media if it's not approved by the Kremlin. So they do it on purpose, deliberately putting these uh, narratives into the mainstream discussion uh, for what? For creating further grounds. And uh, that is why it's important for uh, wherever where it is possible to ban Russian state media and platforms from, from the... Uh, from the possibilities of them to be presented on social media in the uh, to broadcast for the international audience until they uh, so it 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 must go along with the economic sanctions because economic sanctions they uh, put pressure uh, on Russia financially and the sanctions in the information space must be put accordingly so that they will uh, put pressure on Russian information space, making it much more difficult for Russia to push forward the uh, malign uh, disinformation. And uh, also what is more important, but I think that already a lot is done and thank you for, for bringing these questions into discussion because by doing this, you are also helping that a lot, is to give uh, to the broader public understanding of how dangerous is the Russian disinformation, that it's dangerous not only by itself, but because it is, it is used to create grounds for further military offensive. And it, it goes hand by hand with the military op operations. So Russian disinformation is not only uh, dangerous by itself, but because it is used as a mean to achieve political goals and to achieve military goals. And more people should be well aware of that than such uh, events as you launched uh, are very important to do that because they give people the understanding of what is actually happening. And we can call it uh, uh, media literacy, critical thinking, uh, aware, raising awareness, all of that uh, is very important. And I think that a lot has been done, but still we have a long way to go. And I'm actually almost all the every day have contacts with international media who tell me that there are 
two points of view on the war of Ukraine, Ukraine and, and Russia, and that is wrong. There is no two points of view. There is one point of view, which is all free world, all democratic countries, and the other point, which is an, a state of uh, aggressor, who is waging an aggressive war, not only against Ukraine, but against all the free world. And we should not give this aggressor state possibility to spread this disinformation on our platform, because we are not allowed to speak to Russian audience. Everything is blocked there. Russia only uses its own state disinformation and propaganda for Russian population and comes with their narratives to our platforms because we we give them the, the right to speak up this should be changed so that's very important thank you thank you actually it uh, well connects uh, well, well connects to my next question uh, to dr uh, natalia steblin uh, about the role of social media right now inside of ukraine in spreading this information and also providing in this infra- spread of the disinformation could you speak a little about uh, a little bit about this yeah, thank you for your question. Uh, and I want to add that uh, uh, Russian, Russia uses uh, every channel, every popular project possible to spread propaganda. For instance, uh, uh, recently I uh, found a forum, a Russian forum for uh, preg- pregnant uh, women and uh, for young mothers. And uh, they also used this forum uh, just to spread all this uh, falsehood and uh, manipulations. Or, for instance, uh, there are some YouTube channels of uh, uh, psychic uh, uh, psychics who just uh, uh, make some forecasts uh, about our future and so on. So, and uh, um, I also heard uh, some speculations and manipulations and uh, uh, propaganda narratives. And I'd like also to share some. Uh, some pictures uh, I collected uh, especially uh, them for this uh, meeting. So uh, uh, these are examples of uh, social media, uh, di- different social social networks uh, like Viber, like Telegram, like Facebook, uh, and uh, uh, and we see uh, the similar techniques used uh, uh, in uh, uh, several regions of uh, several Ukrainians, uh, Ukrainian regions. So um, there are just, uh, uh, I, 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 I just translated uh, uh, some of these uh, messages and you can just uh, uh, see uh, this uh, information in uh, Ukrainian, Russian and uh, English. Uh, so maybe uh, I just uh, tell you about some narratives uh, that were used uh, uh, on uh, social networks in Ukraine. Uh, For instance, uh, uh, the first narrative was about uh, everything uh, uh, just uh, dangerous because Russians are everywhere and uh, Russians may use your phones or Russians may use, uh, uh, I don't know, your TV sets to destroy you or uh, to maybe to target your uh, house and to uh, just uh, there will be some devastating, devastating shellings and uh, so on and so forth. And even to, today, uh, I uh, just uh, saw uh, uh, messages uh, on Telegram channels, uh, Odessa original Telegram channels, when where uh, people were extremely scary because of uh, uh, regular fog in Odessa. So uh, there was some speculation that maybe this uh, some kind of chemical weapon and, and so on and so forth. So uh, this is just uh, uh, one example. Uh, uh, there is also a second narrative uh, about uh, Ukrainian local authorities uh, that will poison every everyone. And uh, such messages we just uh, observed uh, in uh, different regions, in Odessa, in Kiev, and in uh, Donetsk region. Uh, there was some speculation about that uh, Ukrainian local authorities poisoned uh, water, and uh, it is just uh, uh, were dangerous and and uh, so on and so forth and of course uh, there were speculations about uh, ukrainian uh, uh, armed forces and ukrainian military uh, and uh, this was this narrative that uh, uh, they are also dangerous and uh, uh, they uh, are going to blow up uh, the dam and uh, it is also, uh, and uh, some Odessa regions will sink because of uh, that. And of course, they, uh, um, uh, they also 
recalled uh, that uh, now the uh, head of Odessa regional administration, uh, Maxim Marchenko, uh, he uh, joined the uh, armed forces in 2014, and uh, that's why uh, in these messages they call him a Nazi. So, of course, uh, this uh, Ukrainian Nazi wants uh, military to blow up uh, uh, the whole uh, whole city. And, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, they use social media just uh, to, uh, uh, to speak about uh, some landing operation in Odessa. Uh, but uh, uh, you can see here maybe the first me message. Uh, it was uh, published on the 24th of February at uh, 8 uh, a.m. And uh, uh, there also was a, a falsehood about uh, Russian paratroopers landing in Odessa and even respectable uh, mass media, uh, the New York Times, for instance, they also published uh, this uh, fake information. Uh, so. We just can uh, see uh, how uh, how they can use uh, social media and unchecked information uh, just to horrify uh, horrify everyone. And uh, of course, uh, social networks are used as a weapon. And uh, uh, you, uh, uh, of course, media literacy is extremely important. And uh, uh, we may also see how some Telegram channels uh, encourage Ukrainians to share con content. And of course, uh, 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 Russian intelligence services, they just can use this information uh, for uh, their, uh, their aims. So uh, of course, uh, social networks uh, are, uh, are used as a weapon. and. Uh, uh, of course, we should uh, discover, uh, as scholars, we should discover this problem uh, more uh, more widely and uh, to provide some some answers and some solutions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is to Catherine. Uh, Catherine, what is the role of Russia, uh, Russia, Russian diaspora in Germany in spreading disinformation, uh, considering recent numerous pro-Russian protests across Germany? Some of them were even protesting against Ukrainians fleeing the war. Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, yeah, so for the background, we have like around th three to six million Russian-speaking people in, in Germany, living in Germany. But um, only around 200,000 or 235,000 Russians in Germany, so people with Russian passports. And yes, there have been pro Russian protests in Germany recently, but we have to say that they were rather small. So there were like car protests um, with around 900 cars, for example, in Berlin recently. Um, but still, compared to the, to the number of people who are protesting for Ukraine, for peace, it's a really small number who are protesting pro-Russia. So um, all in all, we can say that it's a rather small, um, it's not really significant in spreading disinformation, mm -hmm. the pro-Russian diaspora. And we also see that many Russians who live in Germany don't support Putin or Putin's mm -hmm. politics, and that's why they live in Germany. So um, they are also against the war, mainly. Uh, Catherine, you also just uh, recently authored uh, a good video about the life of uh, Ukrainians who fled uh, Ukraine. Could you tell a little bit about more how they are actually coping with this information that they are hearing? What you heard about their feelings of what they they know about the situation in Ukraine? Yes. Yeah. So I was uh, talking to a few Ukrainians who fled to um, Germany. And I also was um, at the main station in Berlin and uh, saw many women, of course, and um, children who were very, you, you saw them, that they really, that they were really in war and they were very shocked and traumatized. And also when they are talking to us, they are crying and everything. And you just see the horror. Um, and yeah, regarding disinformation, I mean, they know, of course, that, uh, that Russia is spreading a lot of disinformation. And they seem quite happy to be in Germany now, but they also want to go back um, as soon as possible. And that's what I've seen recently. Hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next question I have for Emerson. Emerson, so uh, could you 
tell us about actually uh, because I know that you examine some 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 uh, media uh, social media outlets. What kind of techno te 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 techniques uh, right now are Russia? Uh, implement, Russia is implemented right now to spread the uh, the fake news. So, uh, in terms of, uh, do you see some patterns? Yeah. So we we have seen, and in fact, Ingrid alluded to this earlier, uh, the growth of Telegram channels where Russians and uh, especially propagandists adjacent to the government. Uh, sort of speak and coordinate, they share uh, their their fact checks or their uh, repudiations of Western stories, which is what Ingrid's research is focused on. But they also are sort of banding together to advance their own narratives. And then they'll they'll move out on for in force. And I've actually I've seen clearest evidence of their coordination here on uh, actually V contact because they're still, when these groups are coordinating, they're, they're then targeting mm -hmm. both Russian indigenous social media, as well as the broader uh, media ecosystem. The challenge is I, I, we know that some of this coordination is happening and that there are now more attempts than there were at the beginning to try to you know reach into the English speaking media. Um, but it's hard to detect this sort of activity because it's not it's not automated and it's not being done at scale. Instead, it's it's small groups of, uh, of volunteers or paid individuals who are uh, basically looking for weaknesses in Western social media conversations to exploit. Uh, Emerson, I have another question for you because before in one of your interviews we were speaking about uh, Troll Factory that uh, was really instrumental in 2016, but uh, and you investigated how that uh, Troll Factory uh, was formed. But can you tell what who is behind what uh, uh, in 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 this particular case in spreading the, this 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 information? I wish we had clear answers to any of these questions, but the, the fact is we don't know. Uh, I mean, the the prototypical Russian troll factory was owned by an oligarch close to Putin. Uh, and in fact, the the troll factory was, it, it was a marketing firm. It was a marketing mm -hmm. firm that was conducting some contracts on behalf of the Kremlin, but its owner and it had its own owner and its own interests and it was um, it was essentially a warping of the the sort of marketing model that we've, we've seen a long time in Western social media firms. This is, it's certainly the propaganda is being initiated, coordinated, and incentivized by the state. But I, I think a lot of it too is um, groups of uh, volunteers, young people in Russia who adamantly believe in uh, the, the uh, Putinist objectives and uh, who are more than happy to uh, to spread hate, to spread lies, to target and dehumanize Ukrainians. I, I think it's these group, groups of younger people who are really taking the initiative because they're, they've been given um, uh, essentially leave to do so. They're, mm -hmm. they're given space. Um, just one, one example here, I think we all know about the, the fake news law, which was passed in the, the second week yeah. of the invasion, which criminalized up to 15 years in prison, any uh, fake news about the military. So that didn't mean that Russian police are then knocking on every door. What, it, what we've seen, what it means in practice is actually then it empowered Russian supporters of Putin, like uh, ultra nationalists and uh, the hardest line militarists to on their own initiative, then go into social media conversations and tell other Russian citizens, you know, you can't say that anymore or the law will get you. So there is this whole other sort of informal layer. Um, this, uh, you can think of this kind of censorship and information manipulation. It's more, more like a spectrum where the state takes some actions, but they do so knowing that there are their supporters in civil society who will then push things to the next level. 
Thank you, thank you, Emerson. Uh, the next question for Ingrid, and it's actually really connected to uh, what Emerson uh, was telling us. Uh, Ingrid, uh, can you tell us about what is actually happening right now with media inside of Russia? Sure. So I'm I'm sure that some people may also have more to add on to what I know about this subject. Um, I would say something very relevant that I've been seeing um, and that Maria discussed a bit at the beginning of the roundtable was um, the amplification of these narratives or you know propaganda through different levels. So now we're seeing it especially start out on Telegram, I imagine BK as well. Um, and in my mind, many of these channels are probably, you know, either incentivized by the government or as Emerson said, like there are varying levels of government control um, happening here. Uh, and then that gets picked up by someone in Russian state media and amplified. Um, and then that gets amplified on Russian state TV. And even now, uh, for example, with war on fakes uh, and the massacre occurring in, uh, that occurred in, in Bucha, um, we saw the Ministry of Defense and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, share some of their posts. So you're really seeing it happen at all levels. Um, and it's tricky because it's coming from these sources that are supposed to be un unbiased or non-political, or you think of them as more legitimate because it's not coming directly from the government or the state media, um, but then it's being amplified by them. So I think that that this is dangerous because they have such a wide audience, obviously, and now that there are almost no other ways to get information, um, it's very easy to just see that and believe it. Uh, Ingrid, you also, uh, may, uh, like in one of your articles, mentioned uh, Yandex. Uh, that Yandex uh, is uh, right now, for, it's like one of the main search agents, and uh, it's also for being a little bit like manipulated uh, in terms of how people can search information. Is it true? Yes. Um, so this is heavily tied into uh, many of the laws that Emerson just mentioned, um, and Russia has been passing new laws and also utilizing some of their older laws um, from a few years ago. Uh, so one of them that impacts Yandex is that these news aggregator aggregators, which Yandex could be considered, um, are actually held responsible for the information that they are showing to Russian citizens. Um, so in this case, if they share false information about the war, um, aka anything that Russia itself considers to be false information about the war, uh, they can get in trouble for this. So the index is in a difficult position. Obviously, they're heavily located in Russia. Um, and, you know, Google itself is even facing pressures from Russia. Uh, but Yandex has chosen to really give in to this, um, and they've done things like restrict the types of imagery that you're seeing. If you search things about the war in Ukraine, uh, they're restricting the links that come back. Uh, so if you go in and type in facebook.com, uh, nothing comes up. <laughs> So it's really, you know, it's very blatant. Um, and along with that, you're seeing Deutsche Well, like you're seeing uh, Radio Free Europe. All of these are just completely wiped off of the index. Uh, so it's it's very interesting looking at that in comparison to what you're seeing on, on Google or other search engines. Hmm. Very interesting. And we started receiving questions from our audience. And I will ask Victoria, Dr. Victoria Yakuda, maybe read some of them for us. Yes, thank you so much, everybody. And also um, for the questions from the audience, that's great to have this discussion here. So the question is, uh, the first one that we got here from the audience is, what are your thoughts? And I understand that some of the participants have uh, you know, partially addressed this question. So um, just in case, if you have anything to add, what are your thoughts on blocking and removal of RT from Western social media firms. How is this different than Russia blocking American news outlets within their country? Shouldn't we be opposed to this type of censorship that is exactly what is wrong with Russia? And uh, in relation to this question, there is another one. Maybe I'll put them together, uh, just yeah. sort of, um, you know, uh, add to the discussion and then please uh, 
tell us your thoughts. Basically, the question is how then can we reach the population within Russia? And is that important uh, for um, counteracting this type of uh, disinformation information that comes out of Russia? So if we um, this is a question from Igor Protsuk. If we uh, block a, a significant amount of Russian propaganda outside of Russia, the end of war will only come from um, within Russia and uh, with changes within Russia. So how then can we reach the Russian audience um, on this subject? So those two questions together. If you have anything, uh, please, um, it's to everybody. Yeah, so uh, maybe we will start like a new round. Maria, maybe you have something to add. Yeah, thank you. Uh, that's actually what I was talking about. And I uh, opened that uh, Levada uh, uh, poll I mentioned just for people who think that we can bring some information to Russian audience. And for that, we do not need to block uh, anything. Just listen to these numbers. Putin's approval in March is 83%. 83% of Russian population approves what Putin does. And it uh, in February, it was 71. So it's more than 10% growth in one month when there was massacre in Bucha, uh, killings of children, rapes of women, mass deportations of Ukrainian to the territory of Russia is supported by 80, 30, uh, sorry, 83 percent of the population. What information can you are you trying to get to people in Russia as they support what their government is doing? Uh, that's one thing. And the other thing is, uh, for me, it is very clear that there is an exact uh, and that exact uh, uh, link and exact uh, 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 so th this is exactly the same thing what is happening and what is doing Russia what Nazi Germany did in 1931-1935 killing millions of Jews uh, burning them, them in gas cameras uh, mass murdering this is the same thing what is happening now in Ukraine I today myself was in a small city Trostenets in, Suma, in Sumsky uh, Oblast, it is destroyed. It's completely like half of the city is not existing. There are mess everywhere. And people are now only started to uh, to bury out the bodies to, to identify who are these people that were killed. I saw myself today with my own eyes, people with tied down uh, hands over their, uh, over their uh, bed with uh, closed eyes and shut down in their heads. Like here, now, right now in 2022, where I live. So what kind of information, what do you want to bring to Russian audience? Show them more of these bodies. Do you think they don't see them? Or they don't understand when uh, Russian troops are looting and taking cars to bring what was looted to Russia, to their families? Don't these families ask them a questions, where did they get these goods? And why did why they were looting and stealing this from houses of Ukrainians? Haven't they heard the interceptions of the voice calls when Russian soldiers tell their mothers that they were raping people here in Ukraine and looting and stealing things from Ukrainians' homes? This is completely the Nazi state, what which is doing now, an aggressive war against Ukraine. What kind of, uh, you know, of censorship we are talking about? Would you give Hitler the same possibilities to talk out and to give Zealand Jews in, um, in during the World War II? The, the, the whole world should understand this is the Nazi state in the aggression war against the whole free world. They now openly say that they should uh, like uh, completely eliminate all Ukrainians, not only some Nazis. Now they talk about all Ukrainians. Yesterday, two, two days before, they published this article on Ria Novosti, so that all Ukrainians are now Nazis and whole nations should be eliminated. What you will wait for until Ukrainians will be burned in gas cameras? So then will be the moment that we can, you know, speak about censorship. 
just consider Russia as a Nazi state and you will be, understand everything, what you have to do and what kind of measures should be taken. Thank you. Sorry for being emotional. Uh, thank you, Maria. We understand this uh, because we also uh, images from Ukraine and emotions uh, are right now really high, not only in Ukraine, but across the globe. Uh, but uh, 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 Natalia Stublina, uh, can you maybe comment on those questions also? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, I uh, think that it is uh, definitely OK to uh, uh, ban uh, RT because RT uh, doesn't produce journalism. It is not a, a pieces of journalism. You uh, may open uh, every textbook about journalism and just to read about professional standards, objectivity, accuracy, uh, completeness and so on and so forth. And you won't uh, find these professional standards uh, in uh, RT uh, materials uh, and uh, of course we have uh, in the euro convention we have uh, uh, such uh, definition as uh, abuse of rights so uh, what the russian journalists uh, do uh, they just abuse this uh, freedom of speech so they use this freedom of speech uh, just to spread all this uh, falsehood and so on and so forth for instance in germany you can't uh, deny uh, holocaust uh, if you denied Holocaust, you, you will have uh, problems. So, of course, uh, there must be some rules for, uh, uh, for everyone in social networks and in, uh, for journalists. Uh, and uh, it is just impossible to use uh, TV channels or uh, traditional mass media uh, for uh, translating all this horrible stuff uh, from uh, Russia, because I think and that uh, Russian uh, propagandists like Solovyov uh, and uh, Simonyan and all these colleagues, uh, they just as, as guilty as uh, Putin and uh, they just as they need to, to be put in uh, in jail uh, uh, and uh, be judged in Gaga or some, somewhere because uh, their uh, uh, crimes are uh, just equal. Thank you. Uh, Natalia, just just uh, like a follow up on what you just uh, said, how is actually Ukrainian media right now for working to uh, 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 defend the uh, media sphere inside of Ukraine? Uh, you know, it is a, a extremely interesting picture because uh, we analyzed. Uh, uh, just coverage of Ukrainian regional mass media uh, in the first uh, weeks of uh, this war. And I may say that uh, before the war, uh, we uh, were observing uh, just plenty of problems uh, with Jinsa. Uh, uh, it is uh, uh, covered advertisement, covered political advertisement in uh, mass media. Uh, uh, our regional uh, newspapers, uh, they also experienced problems with uh, propaganda, with uh, uh, they also sometimes they uh, spread uh, fakes and and so on and so forth but uh, after 20 the 24th of uh, february uh, they just changed i think that they changed uh, uh, as all uh, all of us all uh, ukrainians uh, changed uh, that day and uh, nowadays uh, ukrainian media just uh, uh, trying to uh, cope with all this uh, huge amount of fake news and propaganda. Uh, they also uh, uh, try to do some fact checking. Just imagine in Ukraine, uh, we also have uh, little regional newspapers in uh, Sumy, for instance, in Kharkiv. Uh, and uh, uh, they were operating uh, even when uh, their towns were occup occupied by Russians. So they tried to, to reach people via uh, Facebook or Telegram channels and just to spread uh, official information and just to check information and i think that uh, these ukrainian journalists are also heroes like our military like our uh, uh, police officers because uh, uh, what they were doing was just uh, just great uh, thank you thank you thank you natalia catherine uh, can you comment on the question that we received for, from q a uh, 
uh, on the uh, how we can actually uh, deal with uh, Russia's propaganda. Is it okay uh, to uh, block all of these channels? I know that uh, Germany has implemented uh, some already uh, measures. Yes. Um, so I would uh, totally agree with Natalia that it's okay to ban Russia today because it's not media. It's it's the difference if you block neutral, like, rather neutral or like, trying to be objective. You cannot al always be objective. You always have to reach to be as objective as you can in journalism. But it's the difference if you block media like Deutsche Welle, BBC, or social media in Russia, where you can just get free information, or if you block a disinformation website or disinformation media. So I think it's totally OK, because if you allow Russia today to, to spread their news in Germany, for example, and then we debunk it as, as fact checkers, already thousands of people have seen it. So already thousands of people have read propaganda, and not all people who read propaganda or disinformation read fact checks afterwards. So it's very important to try to fight disinformation before it's it's uh, spreading around so i think it's okay yeah i think just, I, I i i cannot just imagine for you Catherine, as a fact checker how it is difficult for you to report situation in ukraine and can you comment about how actually you are dealing with this <laughs> disinformation as a journalist yeah so i think yeah recently it, it also of course it has been very difficult um but the pandemic kind of prepared us because already the pandemic showed us that Russia is, or also other countries, of course, or other players, but also Russia is spreading disinformation. And now more and more fact, che fact checkers worldwide, but also in Germany, are trying their best to debunk disinformation. And I think it's also very important that we still have journalists on the ground. So they are brave journalists, as also Natalia and Maria said, that um, are in Ukraine and check the information because of course, Russia's propaganda and disinformation is the biggest, but sometimes there's also fake news from Ukraine. So we have to have people inside who check the information. And I think, yeah, that's the biggest challenge to, to have real information from the ground as well. Because Thank it's a very you. emotional topic. So it's clear that sometimes even Ukrainians spread false, false information because it's so emotional. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Emerson, do you have something to add? I do. I, I think the point on RT has been pretty well litigated. There, we're getting a lot of questions on it now, so I will just add, uh, RT is used as a, a weapon of war. Uh, the uh, CEO of RT has described RT as a weapon, and it was clearly used to spread disinformation to amplify and help obfuscate the Russian war effort for the purposes of dehumanizing and decimating Ukraine. I think that's pretty straightforward. Uh, there have been a few questions about Levada and uh, the, the public polling, which Maria cited. And insofar as there was ever reliable public polling of Russia, Levada was the, the firm uh, which you could use. But I do want to note, I am not sure, even in an ostensibly independent uh, pollster in this environment in Russia, that many Russian citizens would be comfortable voicing anything but support for the war. I don't disagree at all with the premise that the majority of Russians appear to support the war effort, nor are they likely to mount significant political resistance to Putin. But I don't think the support is as unitary as the data might lead us to believe. And because of that belief, I think it is still worth uh, trying to keep open some information spaces in Russian society. Uh, I don't think that any mass protest will materialize, and I don't think these sorts of protests would be effective in overthrowing Putin anyway. But the fact is that in the first few days of the war, when there was a lot more public opposition in Russia to the conflict, Russia had to divert attention, especially attention in its information manipulation to domestic Russian audiences. These are resources which they could not deploy either against Ukraine or against the wider world. And so I, I think as we move forward, thinking about the war, um, anything we can do to still provide places for dissent in Russia is something which could work to our benefit in the defense of Ukraine and the defeat of the Russian military.
Thank you. Thank you. Ingrid, do you have something to add? Um, I, I would say that I generally agree with uh, yeah. uh, Emerson's points. Yeah. Rita, uh, we have time for maybe one more, one more question today. So sure. There's a great question from Yaroslav Balan, and uh, it's on the role of Russian and pro-Russian academics in the West um, that are playing in the spread of disinformation and what, in your opinion, could be done in this um, kind of discourse, uh, because, uh, you know, academic fellows are um, very powerful, not only for the students, but also uh, as experts uh, for the same um, kind of discourses in the media that we are talking about. So what do you think on, on the academics in the West? And do you have any suggestions for those? Uh, yeah. Colleagues or uh, yeah. Not. Who would yeah, like to comment? Who would like to comment on this question? Uh, I can just say uh, that we are already working on that. So I, uh, I'm representative of the non-governmental organization in Ukraine, and uh, there is initiative that uh, I myself signed. Uh, that uh, the open letter to uh, European and American think tanks urging them to stop. Uh, to stop supporting and stop cooperating with Russian academics because uh, this is not the time for that. So all we think that all the ongoing programs should be put on hold and no new programs uh, within Russian academics should be started because Russia should be isolated. And it is not the question of some someone personal. It is the question of the isolation of the aggressive country about which I was talking during all this our webinar. So uh, this is the measure of isolation the same as information sanctions and economic sanctions and uh, we think that uh, this should not this program should not be uh, ongoing because uh, we cannot you know consider every uh, issue right now on the uh, uh, so on uh, on the basis of the of the personality we consider them as the uh, they are now representatives of the aggressor country, which has this burden of responsibility for the war of aggressive crime. And the, the court in Hague now opened the case on the war uh, of the war crimes. And the, all the people of Russia are responsible for that. So this is the responsibility for everyone and for academics as well. Yeah, thank you, Maria. Uh, maybe uh, uh, some uh, who wants to comment on this question also. I also may uh, add. Uh, uh, I, I completely agree with uh, Maria because uh, uh, we uh, just observed uh, several examples in uh, uh, Russian media, uh, pro Kremlin media, in, and uh, in uh, pro Kremlin media in Ukraine. Uh, that um, Russians, uh, Russian academics uh, and uh, experts and analysts are uh, often use, uh, used uh, uh, to spread all these messages. And uh, uh, as, a, as a journalist, uh, I know that when you put in your piece uh, uh, a quote and you quote an expert, uh, so people just trust uh, to this expert. So. Uh, sometimes these Russian experts and, and scientists and scholars, uh, they just used to, to justify all Russia uh, does in, in the Ukraine and uh, all over the world. So I completely agree that uh, we should uh, do something with that. And maybe for one more question, we have time, Vita. Do we have some maybe good questions? Um, maybe just a, a concluding sort of a general question. We have already given lots of tips. You have, have given, you know, lots of tips on uh, this kind of digital media literacy uh, that is good to have, uh, to be aware of for the audience uh, consuming this information, you know. But there is one, for example, so um, from Irvin Friesen, right, that uh, there is, uh, for example, uh, there is a list uh, that's been combined at Yale University, um, keeping sort of a list of companies that are operating, not operating in Russia that could be consulted, say, by the um, you know, general audience. So are you aware of any sort of resources, you know, just um, good uh, databases, good websites that you go to, or just little tips 
in information literacy for just the general audience that is consuming today's disinformation from all angles, how do you even sort of begin going about fact checking or um, awareness, cultivating awareness of fake news? If you can uh, give us a couple of just really brief tips just for the audience. And I know that you've said already a lot, but just in case, thank you. Okay, maybe the round, the last round of tips and it will be our conclusion for today. I might, I might start first then, uh, so uh, because I was uh, given uh, trainings for the civil uh, society uh, and on, on the fact checking and uh, verifying information. So to begin with, uh, when you are reading any, uh, any piece of news, you have to watch carefully the source and go on all the links that leads you to the initial source because it will refer to one to one uh, to one media then to the other and then you have to go through all this chain until you get to the initial source and see where the initial news was published and then from there you will have a very clear picture if this is a reliable news channel or not so that is what how i said the russia is doing they will publish some fake news on telegram channel then it will be cited by so-called gray media not well known small media and from this gray media it will migrate to the large media to to the state media so if you see this uh, this news then you go step by step until you get to the to the first source and if it's a telegram channel or something you cannot verify some unconfirmed message of course then that the moment you you have to be very suspicious about what you are being told and you would think that why are you uh, what, what is the purpose of this manipulation then of course you should always check the date because what is usually sometimes is used is that uh, some uh, old uh, information will be put on the web as a new one. The old images will be used, the old videos will be used. So they will uh, use the, the videos that are not correspondent with the, with the actual news. And of course, uh, always look through the news. Do not read only the, uh, the names and the uh, so go, go through all the all the tags don't just uh, don't just sh share something because you like the heading of the news so read what is there because that is how it works that they will put some heading then people will share and there will be some kind of uh, misinformation inside always read what you are sharing and be careful if you feel some emotional thing about the news this might mean that someone is trying to manipulate you and wants you to share this information thank you maria natalia what are your suggestions to our audience uh, yes, it's an extremely important uh, question about uh, media literacy, and uh, I think that uh, media literacy, literacy uh, uh, must be studied at uh, school, at secondary schools, and uh, of course uh, the universities. And uh, uh, media literacy, media literacy isn't uh, uh, important only for uh, journalists uh, or people who uh, just have some job in media, but for uh, everyone. And uh, uh, of course, uh, there are textbooks about media literacy, uh, different workshops, uh, and uh, even uh, uh, I think that even on course era, uh, there are also some uh, uh, splendid uh, courses uh, about this. So uh, it is uh, you, you just can use uh, this opportunity, and uh, uh, maybe to add uh, some tips, uh, just uh, to use your brain, <laughs> just to just to uh, use your critical uh, thinking, uh, and just uh, uh, compare different sources, uh, compare pictures, and uh, compare uh, text. Be because, uh, for instance, uh, Ria Novosti, uh, they uh, now uh, just want to. Uh, and appreciate uh, people that uh, everyone in the world, the com common people all over the world, uh, support uh, Russia. And for this, uh, they use uh, uh, images uh, of uh, uh, several, I don't know, 10 or 20 people who just uh, 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 have uh, some uh, banners uh, with some Russia, uh, Russia forever, and uh, uh, they just publish that. Uh, 
everyone that uh, mass meetings uh, that uh, hundreds of people support Russia. So uh, it is uh, just important to use uh, your critical uh, critical thinking. Thank you, Natalia. Catherine, you are probably the most equipped to provide uh, some like tips how to deal with this information as a fact checker. Yes, thank you. So I think, yeah, you both already um, said very important things. I think maybe the most important thing is that you just read um, mass media or public media. So you have like the background knowledge to know what's happening. Like, for example, what happened to the hospital in Mariupol when you when you read many articles and saw real photos in real media, objective media, neutral media, you know that a video which shows actors in the hospital is just false. So you just have to read a lot of background information, inform yourself now in war times every day, every day new things happen. So that's the most important thing. And then you can just um, follow what you also already said, you both, Natalia and Maria. Thank you. Thank you. Ingrid. These, these have all been really helpful tips and I don't have too much to add. I guess the one thing I would say um, in the vein of uh, the increase in, in fake fact checking, um, find sources that you know are trustworthy. Um, I know there's the International Fact Checking ne Network that, that lists like a number of uh, verified fact checkers. Um, so find your sources and don't just assume that something you see labeled as a fact check uh, is legitimate. Thank you, Ingrid. Uh, thank you to all our uh, participants and also uh, speakers that you provided great information and educated us on what is going on with uh, fake news uh, campaigns and disinformation right now around the uh, uh, Russia's war against Ukraine, not only in Ukraine, but also in the West. And also we touch a little bit about the situation in inside of Russia. So just a reminder that uh, this roundtable was organized by the Contemporary Ukrainian Studies program at the Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies. And we will be continue, continuing to uh, organize uh, different roundtables and, and seminars on different topics about Ukraine and about issues around Ukraine. So please follow us and, and subscribe to our email list uh, and also for visit our website and one more time thank you for connecting with us today thank you